Hello, welcome to the Mediocre Takes podcast, the podcast where we share our mediocre takes on the shows and movies we watch. I'm Mark, and I'm here with my co-host Mel. How are you doing, Mel? When I looked up the show that we're reviewing on YouTube.com, there were a couple searches that came up under it, and one of them was Hetero Awesomeness Month. So, ew, mm-hmm. grody. I want you guys to think about that. I didn't click on it because I was scared. I would be scared too, honestly. I had the playlist saved, so I didn't have to search it up. So, okay, whatever. Yeah, lucky you. We yeah. both know how much you loved this show. Yes, exactly. Uh, I just loved this show so much. <laughs> honestly, okay, can I be honest for a moment? I think it was the first episode that I hated the most. And then after that, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I think it's just the first episode that's that bad. Like everything else is fine. Like it's tolerable, um, which I'll get into. But today we're talking about a web series on YouTube that you can watch for free. Go watch it right now if you want to called Hetero. So let's just get into it. So I usually do like a, a short summary for each episode. However, I was so uninterested in this web series that I just did one big summary that's like really short. So my summary is five friends all in the school's Gay Straight Alliance Club are given the job to add new members into GSA or else the club will be taken down. Now it's up to them to try to make friends with straight people. Also, there's some romance subplots going on that basically becomes the main plot in the last episode. And yeah, anyways, let's get started with episode one. So before I start bashing this show, I want to say I appreciate that this show got made in the first place. I mean, a web series that's free on YouTube about queer people who don't die. That's honestly a miracle. But even miracles have problems, and this one's really full of them. Okay, so the first thing I have a problem with is the dialogue. The dialogue can be funny at some points, but most of the time it took me out of the story because instead of it feeling like teenagers, it honestly just felt like people who are trying to write teenagers, which is so funny because this show was created by teenagers. I don't know, maybe I'm just not like a teenager anymore. Maybe I just don't get it. Maybe I'm just not one of those girlies anymore. It's so strange that you say that because the reason I felt like the um writing was weird was because it was written by teenagers i feel like this is showing me that there is there is there are two extremes where it's like even teenagers can write weird dialogue for teenager characters and adults also usually miss the mark when it comes to writing for teenage characters i feel like it would be even more of a problem if a teenager was writing a teenager character because teenagers don't have anything to like reference themselves to when it comes to other people or adults i guess is what i'm trying to say i don't know something about that i feel like they just don't have that experience to write themselves i guess no that doesn't make sense what am i trying to say (laughs) i was going somewhere with this and i've lost the plot i guess what i'm trying to say it just it in my head it makes sense to me why i feel like teenagers won't be able to write themselves that well but maybe that's just my head i think that's just your head really I think a teenager can write a better teenager than an adult, mm. especially when the adult is like much older because then they no longer have a reference to to what is current what is going on in current events and what would be um the attitude of a current event teenager, I guess. Yeah, so one of the main problems I had is I feel like I was trying hard to be like teenager speak, you know? But I feel like part of that is because it was written by a teenager and so the teenager is obviously going to like put like stuff that teenagers would know. I feel like the teenagers put too much of that in this at some point, especially with one thing. Okay, so I'm going to ask this right now. I wrote this down at like the end of my notes, but I have a question. I feel like I have this question every time, but I forget it. And I honestly have to ask it again every time. But what the fuck is Homestuck? And why do asexuals have to do with this Homestuck thing? Because literally one character mentions trying to get an asexual to join, but that they were too into their Homestuck cosplay. And that really confused me. I don't know why, first of all, Homestuck gets shitted on so hard. And I also thought the last thing I expected from a series like this is for an asexual to catch a stray, you know? That was also kind of strange. So I really, I didn't understand that line in general. Yes, I agree with you. I did not understand that line. I was confused by it. But anyways, let's get back on topic. So the dialogue. I feel like you you have to be like a specific type of person as a teenager in order to like relate to this dialogue or something like that. I don't know, something about it. It just gave me the vibe of a teenager that I specifically wasn't. And I feel like you have to be a specific type of teenager in order to have this dialogue. But even at some points, I felt like the dialogue was still too much, you know? Okay, maybe this is wrong, but I think the issue is something that I feel like takes place in 
shows that are set in high school is there's always a guarantee that there will at least be one scene where a student talks back to a teacher in a way that would never happen in real life. And I think that that's what happens in this, but it happens every single time a student talks to a teacher. Yes, you you are right on the money with that one. I don't know why the students were so casual with the teachers like that. There was this one scene specifically. I think it wasn't with the teacher. It was with like a counselor where like one of the girls says, we're the gay straight alliance. And she says it like in a way as if she owns the school or like they say, as you know, I'm not sure uh, what the pronouns of the character is, but they said it in a way as if like they owned the school or something. And I was like, calm down. It's just the gay straight alliance. Like it's not that deep. But yeah, every single time they talk to like a teacher or a principal or just the counselor, they acted like so high and mighty and like above them. And it was just really weird because sure, there are students who act like that in the real world. However, I feel like a group of queers is not the type of people who would be acting that way, you know? Even if I couldn't relate to these characters, that wouldn't be a problem if I actually liked these characters, which leads to my second problem. During the first episode, at least, I did not like any of these characters, and they all felt kind of the same. Like, I could barely tell them apart. Also, these characters are so obnoxious, and it wouldn't be a big problem if we got more variety between them in the first episode. But since they all give off the same vibe, I couldn't find myself like connecting with any of them or caring about their conflict. So my last thing I have to talk about is I feel like this show overall is okay. However, I feel like the first episode gives such a bad impression of what this show is going to be for the rest of the four episodes that just kind of bogs down the rest of the series, especially with the characters, because I found like the characters actually grew on me throughout the rest of the series. However, they're just so obnoxious and like loud in the first episode and they're they just have no like really character divining moments at all during the first episode. I just feel like the first episode needed some work. And I feel like if the first episode got some work, I feel like I could have liked this show a lot more. And yeah, that's my notes for episode one. Why was there a fridge in the classroom? And it was a fancy one too, like double doored, silver metal and everything. It wasn't even like a science room. It was a, it was like an English room, which it shouldn't be a big deal. But for some reason, that just really confused me. So that scene where the straight girl runs away from the GSA club, that was the scene that I saw on TikTok, which made me like recommend this show. And it made me laugh out loud, like genuinely a hilarious scene. I think that was the funniest scene in this entire show. Okay, episode two. I actually didn't mind Quinn in this episode. I still think they're a bit much and having a gay panic plotline is probably one of the better decisions made in this show. I really like the scene before Quinn meets up with their love interest, where I think their name is Olivia. But before they meet up with Olivia, one of Quinn's friends starts telling Quinn how Quinn's life will spiral if they go after the straight girl. Something about that really hit for me. It worked. I know I already said I don't like the dialogue, but again, I did not like the dialogue in this episode. Also, I will give the show credit. It got me with the get a gay best friend stick in this episode. I did not laugh but I was significantly caught off guard during that scene and it was a welcome surprise. I know that we used the GBF thing to set up Quinn and Olivia, but I also feel like it was the strangest concept they could have used. I'm not mad about it. It's a more original idea than, oh, we were paired up for this class project. I just found it interesting. Okay, the handmade femme shirt that that one girl was wearing. It's totally believable that a straight would wear a shirt that says femme, spelled F-E-M-M-E, without knowing what it means, because those people are also the same people who call themselves tops and bottoms. They also call themselves like pillow princesses or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) They're very strange individuals. I think it's so funny that everyone is like, oh, Olivia can't be gay, she's a cheerleader. And... I can't help but wonder if that's a nod to the cult classic queer film, But I'm a Cheerleader, and I truly hope it is. So was anyone else confused during the Olivia and Quinn conversation? Genuinely, I couldn't keep up, and I can't tell if it was just a me problem. I know you said that you didn't like the dialogue, but I think this was the first time, honestly, probably the only time in this show where I was genuinely like, what is going on here? Yeah, I agree with you. It was it was a bit all over the place, but... I I still enjoyed the conversation for the most part. It just felt like it was going like 100 miles a minute, you know? 
Episode 3. Watching this episode made me realize I actually like how the GSA friend group isn't as close in it as we originally thought. Like Kohen is hanging out with one of the other characters and they talk about how the two of them never hang out and how they want to become like closer friends and stuff like that, which I found to be really nice. I'm not sure how I feel about the reveal that one of the characters has feeling for Kohen. I think it's a kind of following that could go some really boring and cliche places, so I'm not the biggest fan of it. And knowing where it goes now, I think it's fine. I feel like it could, they could have done something interesting with this plot, though. Mickey's presentation about how every Harry Potter character is trans was kind of slay. How do we feel about turning works queer after we find out that the creator is a piece of shit? Okay, so here's my problem. Are you still financially supporting the creator? I would say no. I would say it's it's purely fandom based. Like then fan art, part, fan fiction. For the most part, I'm fine with that, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Because personally, I had Ken and Danny Phantom as trans. Um, Can I just say, I love the fact that they have presentations during the GSA. Yes. Um, there was a one about how I like anime is gay or something. And they actually posted uh, each of the slides on their Instagram. Oh, that's yeah. cool. So, Marco, if you had to choose a straight to be fake friends with, would you choose a guy who's a furry or a guy who's a soccer player? Soccer player. That is interesting. Um, I, I just feel like don't really have a real issue with furries, to be honest. Straight furries, I feel like are a different level. I agree with that 100%. Oh, you bring that up. That is such an interesting variable. Okay, I thought about this way too much, so I'm going to go on a bit of a rant right now. Personally, I would have to flip a coin because both are the same amount of bad to me. And the interesting thing is, I actually thought about this way too much. And even if the genders were reversed, I would probably have to also flip a coin. But if it was a furry guy and a soccer girl, I'd pick the girl. If it was a furry girl or a soccer guy, I'd pick the furry. Now here's where it gets interesting. If it was a non-binary furry versus a non-binary soccer player, I'd choose the soccer player, no coin flip. If it were a non-binary furry and a soccer girl, I would choose the furry. I think you lost me somewhere, but <laughs> yeah. I think I get it at the same time. Okay, okay. When you when you listen to this, you can put it on half time speed and try and decipher what I said. Anyway, the face reveal of the furry is exactly what I expected, and I won't go into further detail. Episode four. Now, I was not expecting the actual furry tale to be in this episode. I thought it'd just be like a little joke mentioned every now and then. Honestly. The fact that they managed to go that far with this joke is something I love. Like when they first mentioned the fact that he's a furry, I'm like, oh, it's just going to be this little thing that's mentioned every now and then. But no, we actually see the tail, which is eh, gross. Honestly, this episode felt a bit forced because they knew the next episode would be like the finale. And there were some things that felt a bit rushed because of this, specifically the breakup. I could see it happening. I just feel like it needed more time in the oven. And that's it. The first time I ever felt targeted by this show was during the Jennifer's body scene. I, f I just feel like for a lot of lesbians, <laughs> that scene where the where um, Jennifer and Needy kiss was so magical. I do think it's funny that the incident between Mickey and Cohen happened at a Pizza Hut and not a Denny's. That just feels sort of weird. Sarai's question for the furry about if they drink from the same watering hole once again made me laugh out loud i honestly think sarai is my favorite character even though she gets like the least amount of screen time anyway this episode really said no one gets to be happy okay episode five again i stopped caring about the plot so i only have one thing to say which is that i think the ending is fine i think i would have preferred it if they didn't try to be so serious these last two episodes like i feel like i wish it stayed more comedy focused like it was before so yeah i, I don't really love the ending but at the same time if that's what they want to go for then i get it so nitpick this takes place in oregon and assuming it's not in eastern or southern oregon there's no way it was warm enough at night, not during the summer, for them to be able to sleep in the trunk of a car with the trunk door open and not freeze. Not yet. At least climate change is working its way into Oregon, but we're not there yet. Yes. Okay, question. What season does this take place? Because like now, now that you mention it takes place in Oregon, I'm like, wait a minute. It had to have been near the beginning of the school year because they talk about how they have been 
um, I, I'm pretty sure they're seniors because they were like, oh, we've been in uh, GSA for three years now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, no, it has to happen at the beginning of the school year. So like in fall. Yeah, that doesn't make sense then. Yeah. Anyway, we're from so Oregon, by the way. Don't tell them they're going to find out where we live. <laughs> <laughs> No, Let me we just don't live in Oregon. We just know a lot about Oregon's geography. <laughs> yeah, we just know where like all the whitewashed places are, you know? <laughs> like every place? Yeah. Except like Northeast Portland. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I did honestly think that the twist would be that Olivia was going to get her cheerleader friends to be a part of the GSA to save it. I genuinely did not expect her to pull that actually I'm not a homo card. Because I don't know, it just felt so, it felt kind of cliche, which is strange because for me i thought this show was gonna like defy the cliches but that was the one that just they just had to keep in i guess um do you forgive olivia no me too and that's all i have to say on that i think this is another cliche where it's like not only does the person say i'm uh, not gay actually but then at the end you know the person they were with was like oh so you you never had any feelings for me and you never loved me wow okay and then that one person is like oh, no, I, I really got to show them that I love them. And then they do like this grand thing at the end. Happiest season, anyone? Yeah, exactly. When Quinn gave their speech, I saw a person with short blue hair in the crowd. You can't convince me that wasn't a queer. I don't know why they weren't in the last scene. Overall, I think this is an okay show. I personally don't like it. I think it was the first episode for me. It just gave me a really bad first impression. And it, I honestly couldn't shake the first impression off throughout the rest of the show while I was watching it. Maybe if I gave myself a break between episodes, I would have liked it more or something. But um, that first episode was just really rough in my eyes. I did like everything else for the most part, though. And I would recommend this to queer people because I think if you're queer, you'll probably enjoy this. This is honestly one of the most normal GSAs I've ever seen. In general, this was a pretty good show, I would say. What I loved is how each character has their own storyline. I did wish we got a bit more time with Zell and Sarai's storyline, but I understand that they were working within their limits. Honestly, this would have been my everything if I watched it when I was 12, and I really hope this helps other queer youths feel seen, feel heard. Maybe this is what makes them realize they're queer. And that's why it's so important to support projects like this. Stuff like this wasn't on YouTube when I was younger. The closest I had was watching picture slideshows of made up conversations between Gwen and Courtney from Total Drama Island with the song Teenagers by My Chemical Romance playing in the background. So it's really great when we get something as high quality as this made. And genuinely, I love that this was made by queer teens and not a heterophobic entertainment company like Netflix or The CW. Header, oh no, it's time for the Mediocre Minute Pride Edition. <laughs> so my recommendation is an EP. It's Cobra by Cobra. This is a very different genre from the other albums I've recommended, so keep that in mind. My personal favorites have to be Good Puss and Bang. I also really love their uh, single, Mommy. Marco, what is your recommendation? So my recommendation is a book called This Is How You Lose the Time War. This is a dual po po okay. This is a, <laughs> <Poo>. <laughs> yeah. this is a dual POV novel. It's about these two women who become like romantically evolved eventually. So this is a lesbian novel. It's about them. They're both again. A, um, what? You just love lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> we follow both of them as they're both in this time war and it's about them like basically writing love notes to each other um throughout time while someone is following them and trying to figure out what's going on in the story it's really good i really enjoyed it the writing can be a bit like what's the word i'm looking for a bit lengthy i guess a bit magical a bit over descriptive i guess at least from what i remember i'm not sure if you're someone who likes that like if you'll enjoy that it's a pretty good novel i enjoyed it and that's my recommendation you can find both of these recommendations in the description of this episode yes Anyways, you guys, Mal's dying right now. They're like covering their eyes because something's wrong. There's something wrong going in my eyes. That, that's really bad. You should probably get that checked out. Okay, you know what? Some of us don't want to go to the hospital every <laughs> week. Listen, just because I went to the hospital six times um, doesn't mean you have to like call me out on it. Anyways, you guys, that's our thoughts on Hetero. If you want to send us a voice message on Spotify for podcasters, there'll be a link in the description to do so below. We also Instagram and Twitter, which are Amitake Squad, and it's everything. So goodbye.